Today, it's really hard to mention Mars without thinking of the man who is hell-bent on getting us there, Elon Musk. As the richest man on Earth tries to accelerate Starship's development, our dreams and hopes for life on Mars are becoming more probable by the day. That said, most of us know as much about Mars as your average sixth grader, and close to nothing about what life would be like on the Red Planet. So why don't we turn to the professionals for this one? What do scientists really think of Elon's plan to colonize Mars? Brian Cox, the famous English physicist and TV personality, is known for his undying passion for space and human advancement. Speaking on an episode of the Joe Rogan Experience, Cox said that Elon Musk was right to pick Mars as humanity's next destination, mainly because there are no better options. In response to Joe's joke about the harsh conditions on Mars, Cox laughed and compared Martian life to life in the Wild West, where nearly everything was out to kill you. Cox said that some parts of Mars are actually more habitable than others, like the bottom of Hellas Crater, where temperature are sometimes as warm as 20 degrees Celsius. Cox believes that in that sense, the idea of colonizing Mars is realistic. On June 30th, 2018, Brian Cox hosted a panel of scientists for the Asteroid Day event and asked them a few questions relating to Elon Musk colonizing Mars. Richard Dawkins, the British evolutionary biologist, had some interesting thoughts on Elon's exploits. When asked whether it was possible for humans to live on Mars from a biological perspective, Dawkins answered, I'm a great believer in human ingenuity, and I'm a great fan of Elon Musk. Musk who wants to colonize Mars. I think that the greening of Mars is actually a possibility, a serious practical possibility. It is a wonderful challenge, bringing together different sciences. It's a fascinating project and probably a worthwhile one for the medium-term future. In a recent interview with Time magazine, Elon said that he has big plans for the next phase of space exploration after SpaceX's Starship rockets land on Mars within the next five years. Elon said, The next really big thing is to build a self-sustaining city on Mars and bring the animals and creatures of Earth there, sort of like a futuristic Noah's Ark. We'll bring more than two, though. It's a little weird if there's only two. In the interview, Elon reiterated that his overall goal has been to make life multiplanetary and enable humanity to become a space-faring civilization, which ties into his idea to take animals and plants to Mars. Whether or not Elon was serious, experts were quick to show their skepticism and were quick to point out the huge challenges of raising livestock on a planet without oxygen. Roger Weens, a scientist who is currently leading the SuperCam laser instrument on the Perseverance Mars rover, was among the critics. Speaking to the Daily Mail, Roger Weens said, Mars, with its CO2 atmosphere might be a good place to grow plants if they're kept warm and watered, but it would be a terrible place to drop off animals who need oxygen to breathe. Roger remarked that humans might be smart enough to wear oxygen breathing systems, but animals, not so much. And we'd end up with a lot of dead animals on Mars. He suggested that botanical gardens should come first. Jonathan McDowell, an astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, was also skeptical of Elon's plans. According to McDowell, it would most likely take multiple centuries until humans are able to raise animals on Mars. Humans can only exist as part of a biosphere, which is a complex ecology with many species. If we're to build a human civilization on Mars that is self-sustaining, then yes, we will have to do the Noah's Ark thing at some level. McDowell said that he did not rule out early Martian settlers towards the end of the century bringing their pets. But he stressed that the idea of raising livestock or wild animals in significant quantities was still a long way in the future. McDowell believes that the populating of Mars by animals, plants, and viruses was the inevitable long-term logical outcome, but he also believes it will take centuries. Robert Lillis, associate director of the Planetary Group at the Space Science Lab in Berkeley, shared McDowell's sentiments. Robert joked that scientists were unlikely to be bringing any aardvarks, marmosets, or pumas to Mars, at least not any time soon. Lillis, who is currently involved in both NASA's MAVEN Mars mission and the Emirates Mars mission, said that Elon Musk made an important point about the long-term future of life on other planets. Lillis said, he's not wrong in a larger sense. For a self-sustaining colony, we need to establish an ecosystem of certain plants and animals kept in balance with an assist from life support systems and horticultural and veterinary technology. Speaking to the Daily Mail, Lillis even joked and said that it would be the new Garden of Eden, but probably better known as the Garden of Elon. Professor Dave Bryan, an assistant professor of astrophysics and planetary science at the University of Colorado at Boulder, said that Elon Musk raised some relevant questions. Speaking to the Daily Mail, Bryan said, It's important to have big thinkers in society, and Elon Musk consistently thinks big. According to Bryan, there are three key elements of Elon's vision. 
a city on Mars that is self-sustaining and that supports diverse biological species. He believes that the self-sustaining part is the most challenging aspect to achieve. We don't know how to do this yet, and it's not clear that this is feasible for Mars. But without people pushing on the idea, it'll take a very long time to find an answer. Some scientists are much more optimistic about Elon's plans. For instance, Robert Zubrin, president of the Mars Society and founder of Pioneer Aeronautics, said that Elon Musk was on the right track. Speaking to the Daily Mail, Zubrin said, We will bring many types of animals and plants to Mars. Maybe not all of them. There are many better left behind. But once on Mars, they'll evolve new forms better adapted to Mars gravity, for example. That's what happens when species move into new environments. So we won't just preserve existing forms of life, we will open the way for new types to be born. Christopher S. Edwards, an associate professor at Northern Arizona University's Department of Astronomy and Planetary Science, said he thought Elon's plans were valid. I don't think the idea of bringing animals along is horrible. Livestock was brought on sailing vessels crossing the ocean long ago. Edwards continued to say, more than two of each for sure, both for genetic diversity, but also because you'd be pretty disappointed if you got used to eggs and your only source died. Edwards also aired his concerns about the self-sustaining part of Elon's mission. The ability to make a completely self-reliant outpost is likely to be very difficult. The identification of resources available is clearly an important first step. However, I fully expect human space travel to Mars to be heavily reliant on Earth resources for a long time, operating much like humans on the moon have operated. Edwards said that experiments were currently ongoing to try sustainable options, but full sustainability was still a very distant possibility. Starship, the vehicle that is supposed to make our Martian dreams a reality, is receiving just as much attention as the mission itself. Starship's promise has everything to do with its size and potential potential for reuse. According to SpaceX, the 120-meter-tall spacecraft will be able to transport a payload of 100 metric tons, with the greatest volume of any existing launcher. And like any other orbital launch system, Starship would be fully reusable, and Elon has said that this could lower launch costs to about $2 million a pop. Walid Abdelladi, director of the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder, says that launching a large telescope into space can cost more than $100 million. And and reducing that price by two orders of magnitude would have an immense impact on remote sensing. Depositing payloads of telescopes and satellites into orbit would help climate science in two ways. First, by restocking devices that typically have a three to five year lifespan, Starship could create a cheaper way to carry out sustained observations of Earth. Second, it would enable more ambitious scientific missions, such as a return to the Moon and the mission to Mars. Starship could also indirectly benefit the state of suborbital and orbital science by bringing space debris back down to Earth. Space poses hazards to launching vehicles and operational orbiters. According to Abdullahi, any solution to reduce crowding in the skies would be tremendously important. Depositing payloads and reclaiming others in orbit is an added perk to Starship's stated goal, which as we all know is ferrying cargo and eventually crews to the Moon and Mars. According to the recent white paper, whose author list includes researchers affiliated with NASA and SpaceX, the company currently plans to launch multiple uncrewed Starship missions to Mars every two years, each time exploiting a planetary alignment particularly favorable for the voyage. The authors write that without a crew, there's great potential to unload cargo on Mars, as well as to bring back samples from the planet. Elon Musk's colonization of Mars now seems like a foregone conclusion. No longer a matter of if, but when. And we can't wait to see Elon's colonization of Mars begin, as it ushers in a new age of humanity, one in which humans are an interplanetary civilization. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, welcome to the future.